My people, sons and daughters of Helgan, for many years we have been a broken nation, shunned, oppressed, and conquered by those we sought to escape. Ten years ago, I asked for time, and that time was granted by you, you, the strength in my arm, the holders of my dreams. Let's go back to the early 2000s. Video game consoles were blowing up in popularity and companies like Microsoft and Nintendo were raking in the cash on platformers, puzzlers and racing games. But if there was one genre that was seemingly hard to get right despite thriving on the PC, it was the first person shooter. Microsoft had their exclusive and the Bungie developed Halo series, genuinely pushing the genre forward while being a gamepad first experience. Halo changed the scene, seemingly overnight. Console FPS games now weren't just viable, but if you didn't have a flagship one on your own, you'd miss out on a huge market. And so, Sony, despite having one of the most successful consoles of all time in the PS2, lacked a true first party FPS, revealed Killzone. And it didn't take long for the media to declare Killzone Sony's Halo killer and completely run with it. But this, this wasn't just a Halo killer. This was something completely different. Double kill, hill control, triple kill, hill occupy, killing spree, kill king attack, kill. Kill. running run. These were the sounds that personified an entire generation of kids growing up in the early 2000s. Bungie's Halo combat evolved through its long and windy development path that finally, in 2001, released on Microsoft's brand new foray into the console market, the Xbox. And instantly, it was a hit beyond what anyone could have imagined. You can talk to me, I'm here. I'm no, here, we're Jinch. not talking to you. Yeah, stop being a prick. You suck. Tim. It was nowhere close to being the first console FPS, but with its explosive entry onto the scene, it opened the eyes of a whole generation as to what their beloved consoles could do, and maybe more importantly, could do really, really well. Combat Evolved went on to sell millions upon millions of copies and still remains a catalyst for a new wave in the game's history. I loved Halo which might be the most I'm not like the other boys kind of thing I've ever said. Everyone loved Halo. It was all we talked about. How to beat a certain level on Legendary, the insane snipes we hit on Blood Gulch over the weekend, or how there was allegedly a flyable pelican somewhere in the game. It consumed our minds. But there was always something missing. The world presented in Halo was incredibly well thought out and well explained, but young me growing up reading book after book and seeing any film I could find about the Second World War, the vibrant colors and alien geometry of Bungie's Halo did little for me. I found myself striving to always use UNSC weapons because they looked more like the counterparts I'd been reading about. And while every Saturday morning started off with a couple of rounds on Battle Creek, Subconsciously, I longed for something different. Little did I know that that something had been brewing. In a country with deep ties to the history I'd become so intrigued with, a completely new take on the console FPS was in the pipeline. 1999. In a world on the cusp of the new millennia, there was hope. In Europe, the Cold War was in many people's minds over and the forever peace whispered about after the two world wars was finally dared to be dreamt of. The technological revolution of the information age had just kicked into overdrive. And as the interactive medium of video games started to rival that of Hollywood and the record labels in the North Atlantic Bastion of the Netherlands, a small, seemingly inexperienced studio by the name of Orange Games were in talks about creating a new space shooter with none other 
an industry titan, Sony. But the Netherlands was in an interesting position at the time. A highly technologically advanced nation with close ties to every other Western tech power. But as the developers themselves stated, the Netherlands was not exactly known for its game studios. And even after Orange Games merged with the two other comparatively large houses in the country, their combined efforts were barely still enough to return an echo on the grander global picture. But the Dutch weren't slacking. They didn't lack creativity. Instead of designing video games, they were designing, well, this. Containers, buildings, houses, homes. The Dutch design market was overflowing, with world-renowned industrial and graphic engineers pioneering something that came to be known as Dutch design. A clean, minimalistic style that influenced the world over. No video games, no interactive media, so you take what you have. Design, after all, is just design, right? But without fully knowing it, the development team for this new Sony-funded space shooter approached the art of visual game design in a fundamentally different way. The trained industrial designers comprising a large amount of the team had to live and breathe the limitations of the physical world, for they had always created things that would function within it. So why would they cut corners here? Why should a fictional digital world not be held to the same standards? A car that would roll down the streets of central Amsterdam needed to function, where recall would be inevitable. And so the design team went to work, making sure that any futuristic space shooter door, building apparatus, machine, weapon or car would do the same, whether they were rolling into Amsterdam or Vecta City. These sketches from the official art book detail a world immaculately designed to enthrall players even without engaging gameplay. Straight from the playbook of industrial design, they wanted their world to capture the player's imagination before they even fired a bullet. Up to the ultimate reveal at the largest entertainment expo in the world at the time, the development allegedly went through multiple different ideas and concepts. Aliens, clones, more established sci-fi tropes were all experimented with, but nothing felt right. Nothing felt real enough. So just like with the visual design, they sought inspiration from what they knew. They reached back into their own nation's history and pulled back something deeply coded into their upbringing. As they themselves state, what if humanity fought itself? The 10th of May, 1940. Dutch citizens awoke to the roar of the Luftwaffe of the Nazi war machine blacking out their skies. Seven days later, the whole region, consisting of the Netherlands, Belgium and Luxembourg, had fallen under Axis control. The Second World War soon ravaged the globe, and not until five whole years later, after millions upon millions of casualties, was the evil pushed back and people could once again breathe. This was a piece of history the developers themselves describe as deeply embedded within the Dutch national identity, with many of the original developers of the now-renamed Guerrilla Games recalling their school days full of stories of the war. So naturally, if you set out to tell the tale of a galactic conflict, one handling topics of national pride and justice and race, and one between kin, surely you can do worse than just taking a look at one of the biggest conflicts the world has ever known. With that, they knew they needed an enemy. Something that would seem both indescribably evil, but just like the rest of the visual design, also capture the player's attention by their presence alone. An enemy that, just like their clear inspiration, would seem a spirit risen straight from the depths of the underworld. That enemy became the Hellgast. In the time you have given me, I have rebuilt our nation. I have rebuilt our strength. And I have rebuilt our pride. Our enemies at home have been re-educated. We have given them new insights into our cause. On this day, we stand united once more. On this day, those driven to divide us will hear our voice. On this day, we shall act as one and we shall be ignored. No! Defenders of the Hellgas dream, now is our time! 
This is the first thing new players saw when they inserted their brand new game disc in November of 2004. But even before then, the glowing eyes of the Hellgast had cemented itself as part of one of the most iconic bad guys ever put to screen. This reception resulted in a confidence from Sony and the game was pushed as the next big thing for the PlayStation 2. And as their rivals in green had been reaping what they sowed with their own futuristic space shooter for a number of years, with its successor releasing only days after Guerrilla's debut, Killzone became the prodigal child for the Japanese megacore. The developers were just along for the ride now. The media had found their scoop. Killzone was the Halo killer. marketing had appeared to work. By the end of 2005, the game had shipped over 2 million copies and the iconic visual design had been cemented within the PlayStation brand. Killzone was just like the marketing and the media had pushed it, just like its green armor clad rival, a space shooter. It was also a console first experience and featured both single and multiplayer modes, but that was really where the simulator stopped. The Halo series had been praised and paraded around the digital town square for its incredibly accessible minute-to-minute -minute gameplay that always seemed to put having fun at the very forefront of the experience. Halo designer Jamie Griesmer's famous quote about if you manage to design 30 seconds of enjoyable gameplay, you can pretty much just stretch that over an entire game is maybe the most simple way of describing Halo, but at the same time, maybe the most accurate one as well. Anyone could pick it up, instantly grasp the basics and before long hit earth shattering quickscopes across the map. Movement was floaty, jump height was nigh obscene and every design decision seemed to push you to explore and test the limits of what they had built. The talk around the town pitted the two series against each other as equals. Equally committed they without a doubt were, but while Halo was towards fun, Killzone seemingly strived for something else. These games are wildly opposed. I don't think you need a PhD in being pretentious about video games to see that these games play incredibly differently. Now I'm not out here saying Killzone isn't enjoyable. Any time I play through it, I'm having the greatest time, but am I having fun? Like jumping a warthog, run over 12 grunts and then push my friend off a cliff kind of fun? I don't think so. Killzone is deliberate, it's grounded, gritty, and for me, despite both of them being completely made up far future sci-fi stories, undoubtedly feels more real. So did it end up killing Halo? For the masses? Absolutely not. It sold well, yeah sure, but I mean Halo is, is a juggernaut. It'll be around long after both you and me are gone, but for me, oh it absolutely did. You are Captain Jan, Templar of the Interplanetary Strategic Alliance. Stationed on your home planet of Vecta, and just as the game starts, you are holding off a first landing force of the Hellcast aggressors. Thrust headfirst in the middle of a cold war just gone hot between people sharing the same ancestors. The conflict Killzone puts you in the middle of is far from black and white, filled with injustice, oppressive regimes taking advantage of power vacuums, and deep, long running conspiracies. But as you take your first steps, all of that is secondary. Because for me growing up reading page after page of the famous battles of World War II, Killzone from frame one manages to capture something other games hadn't. Wait. Squad, move out! I got company! Enemy spotted! Scatter! Grenade! Playing Killzone is slow. 
at times sluggish and the momentum you carry as you move your character around is palpable. It is a deliberate experience. Every step, every shot and every action is steeped in this determination to despite carrying around seemingly hundreds of pounds of armor, ammunition and gear defend this place you call home. Because the same approach the visual designers took when making sure that every detail, every element has a tangible function, it is clear that the gameplay designers had a similar way of thinking. War is hell. And while Killzone is set in the 2300s in the Alpha Centauri system, it feels unequivocally human. The desperation of the scenarios you find yourself in as your planet is overrun within hours by a militarily superior foe is echoing histories many communities still reel from, and Killzone stuffs you into boots firmly planted on the ground and screams at you to do your job. <laughs> Shell shock. The first level of trenches, bombed out cities and ruins of your once prosperous civilization serve as the proving ground, allowing for the shock to wear off and you to accept your new role. Every step, a struggle, every breath, a blessing. It soon becomes second nature, because just as the cars, guns and buildings all needed to be designed as if they would function in a real war, so were you. Heavy, slow, lumbering and sluggish, but function. This is how many players and reviewers describe the game as a whole. Sluggish but functioning. The critics left mixed reviews for the most part, praising the artistic direction, but stating that compared to the competition it felt unpolished, unfinished and undecided, unsure of what it really wanted to be. But I think it was clear. The inexperience within the team might have shown through the cracks at times, but conviction of what Killzone was supposed to be I don't think was ever a problem at Gorilla. With the hype train going off the rails, it was just not what people expected it to be. Review scores and critical reception aside, the game did end up selling well and even received a top-down spin-off on the handheld PSP. But the problem was, as the dust settled on Gorilla's first outing, the PS2 was hardly the graphical powerhouse it once was. And as just a year after the game's release, the next console generation was kickstarted by the Xbox 360, Sony needed something new. Something that would truly stun audiences for their up-and-coming competitor, the allegedly power unrivaled PlayStation 3. Once again, the spotlight shifted to Europe's low countries. Because Gorilla wasn't done with their futuristic extra solo world war. And anyone who thought differently, they will know that this conflict had just gotten started. They will know that there was a burning hatred still ravaging the skies. They will know that the history of these days was to be written in blood. They will know. Helgan belongs to the Helgans. Twenty one eleven. Nuclear war has rendered the Earth nigh on uninhabitable, and for the survival of humanity, a solution is dearly needed. A coalition of the remaining governments and the largest corporations still sharing the planet see a fleet of ships sent extra solar to search for resources, for solutions, for a home. The survey fleet reaches Alpha Centauri, and two candidate planets for colonization are found. After a long, arduous voyage, the ensuing solar flare crippled colony fleet joins them. And as this last ditch effort starts running low on its own resources, the Earth based entity operating them, the UCN, sells the colonization rights to their competitor. Amidst rumors of bribery and blackmail, the two planets are named so to honor their new pilgrims Vecta and Helgen. That's how we got all wrapped up in this. That's what they say, at least. The next part of history is a mess of legislation, tariffs and taxes no one wanted to pay. But it's funny to think that back then, we both lived on Vecta. Helgen was, is, 
for the lack of a better word, hell. Completely barren, natural disasters allegedly happening every other week in an atmosphere rumored equal to smoking a thousand packs a day, it's not strange that the exodus took a toll. The colonization rights made the Helgen Corporation extremely wealthy, and the natural resource-rich hellscape of the desolate planet Helgen became one of the crucial supply nodes for the rebuilding of Earth. The Helgens held all the power in the system, in the mid-22nd century bought it out completely, and with the verdant Vecta as their home for nearly a hundred years, in 2199, after the UCN had demanded they still align with Earth's objective, and remove tariffs, taxes and legislation favoring their own within the system, the Helgens declared their independence. The first extrasolar war was over mostly within the year. The Helgens outnumbered UCA personnel, forcefully evicting them off Vecta, but the ISA was a highly trained military force. The war had started off rough for the newly independent, but it quickly got even worse. What had started off as a trade dispute was deemed multitudes more serious, and as to send a message to any other independence aspiring colony, the UCA sent their cutting edge navy to deal with the secessionists. The Helgen governing body was disposed of, and as terrorist actions arose all around Vecta against the newly put in place Earth loyal government, the ISA, still in order to discourage any independence movement throughout the colony worlds, acted harshly against the Helgen population. In a bid to avoid an even bigger catastrophe, however, the UCN allowed the Helgens to retain their governance over planet Helgen, and as the decisive force of the ISA seemed impenetrable for the survivors, a mass exodus occurred. Millions of Helgens took refuge, having nowhere else to go but for what looked like their own grave. Helgen. A hundred and fifty years they stayed down there. The first decades were hell. People were dropping like flies, children doubted they'd see their tenth birthday, and the air of desperation rivaled the cloudiness of the atmosphere. The Helgens were looking for anyone, anything to guide them, tell them how to go on, how to live, how to survive. Enter Scholar Visari. Three generations on from the Exodus, the now native Helgen population had been forced to adapt to evolve, cell structure modified, organs more suited for the harsh conditions, and the nearby sun's inability to pierce the smog had left the refugees with a constant reminder of the history their forebears had gone through and that they still reeled from. This was the spark that lit the flame of war. Visari was a charismatic leader from the start. He saw his opportunity to rise to the top of Helgen society and his rousing speeches declaring their people as superior, the next step in evolution over their earthly ancestors, managed to gather the population in hatred for the now generational native Vectas. In the shadow of a despised Vecta, Visari established his authoritarian rule. Political opponents re-educated, any weakness disposed of, and a war machine unlike any before it created. The Helgens were no longer. The Hell gassed was the next step in nature's cause, and 150 years after the exodus, they were back to reclaim what they believed was theirs by birthright. In 2357, the Visari-led invasion of Vecta commenced. That invasion was the story Gorilla told in Killzone 1. When I first played it, I smelled there was something deeper going on than just shoot the evil spaceman. The universe Gorilla had drafted up was far deeper and more nuanced than I could ever have imagined. It's clear they cared deeply about their world and the story they wanted to tell. So when talks with Sony intensified about a follow-up, not only being on the cards, but for it to receive major spotlight, marketing funding and support, it's easy to imagine the excitement the small studio must have felt. But the PS2 was old news. This was the seventh generation now, and the Blu-ray equipped PS3 was rumored to decimate everything else on the market. 
The console was set for a 2006 release, so the year before was used to drum up excitement, and Sony needed something big, something almost unbelievable to solidify the hype. And with those amber eyes piercing through the dark, at the biggest stage in the industry, they showed off what they confidently said was real. Killzone 2 gameplay. This isn't real gameplay. It looks fantastic, but there's no way, right? At the presentation itself, they didn't say much, but as people started to question if this was actually real time, Sony said the fable words, it was real gameplay. And just to make the story even better, people still didn't buy it. It just looked too good, too fluid, too next gen. Sure, the PS3 might be powerful, but this was leaps ahead of its competitor Xbox, right? So Sony backpedaled for a second before launching off again. Sure, sure, it wasn't real time, but it was done to PS3 spec. It wasn't. This was a target render. A visualization of what they were striving for. And no one knew this better than the studio back in the Netherlands. As this was going on, they were screaming into pillows, tearing their hairs out, and as they slowly calmed down, figuring there was no way people would believe Sony right. The Killzone 2 they had planned was not even a PS3 game at the time, it was just a PS2 concept. And this video was nothing but a visualizer. No one would believe it was gameplay. But Sony didn't help the matter. The small studio had just been given ungodly expectations on the biggest stage in the world, so what do you do? When the bar is set too high to even begin to consider trying to lower it, do you just give up? Throw in the towel? Try to create something accessible with mass appeal to maybe reach as high as possible, knowing you'll probably miss? That didn't feel like the gorilla way. So they got their heads down. Same way they'd done with the predecessor, they knew what they were good at. They knew what they wanted to say. So when they got the chance to finally show gameplay, real, actual, real-time running PS3 gameplay, with the ridiculous expectations still haunting them, they managed to do what seemed impossible. The Killzone 2, they finally in 2009 released, somehow, some way, looked better. Killzone 2 is, for me, without a doubt, the best looking game of all time. Look, I know it's a PS3 game. I know that it runs at like 720p at like 25 frames per second. I'll get into all of this. It's just not a great time right now, okay? With Killzone 2, Guerrilla Games hit the ground running, reaching beyond 300,000 units sold in the first 48 hours in the US alone and barely taking three months to reach the fabled 1 million mark. People loved the experience that Guerrilla had presented them with and whether the sky-high expectations were met or not was quickly forgotten. The package delivered was substantial enough to enthrall the player base regardless. Just like the original outing, it featured a cinematic campaign continuing the story of the second extrasolar war and a robust multiplayer mode. Unlike its predecessor, however, the PS3 was now fully integrated into the online sphere and as it had become standard for shooter games to host deathmatches on the World Wide Web, Killzone 2 
was no different, and for a lot of players this was THE FPS game they played growing up. But while the success and mass appeal was finally there, there was still something fundamentally different about Guerrilla's War, something still not really found elsewhere. Something heavy. After Visari's invasion had been thwarted in Killzone 1, the ISA found themselves at a crossroads. The supremacist fascist dictatorship that Visari had established on Helgen had just been dealt a substantial blow. And while their own organization's previous actions still haunted them, they realized that leaving the Hellgast regime to recoup and regather itself could lead to far worse scenarios. So the decision was made. Operation Archangel was penned, and in 2359, the counter-invasion of Helgen commenced, landing ISA troops right in the middle of Helgist capital, Pyrrhus. Killzone 2 is a war game. Hey, Georgia, how's it going, well, obviously, but that's kind of what I mean. There's no mistaking it. The analogs to the end of the Second World War as apparent as this invasion is going poorly, and no one in their right mind would think of it as anything else. This is boots on the ground combat. This is dust and grime and hell on hell again, and I wasn't lying before. Killzone 2 is my favorite looking game of all time. It's the game I instantly think of when people discuss what game has the best graphics. Sure, it's not perfect. The textures are blurry, it's 720p on the PS3 and it runs kind of wonkily, but Gorilla's vision for their world is anything but. Killzone 2 is of a one-track mind. It doesn't do a lot. It's grey, black and in a few instances deep red, but it's all part of the plan. It's clear Gorilla didn't care to create a massively diverse experience with biomes, landscapes and locations ranging from all over the color spectrum. They wanted war. Deep, regrettable, grimy and hellish war. Your first steps aboard the ISA cruiser before Planetfall are your last taste of familiar civilization. Bright, clean hallways precisely engineered to endure a battle through the emptiness of space are quickly exchanged. As your intruder dropship hits the outskirts of Pyrrhus, your entire world is transformed. The battles through the ruins of Vecta were dystopian, but it's not until now, almost five years later, that we finally get to see what Gorilla were thinking all this time. Every engagement in Killzone 2 is steeped in desperation. Every step deliberate and every shot fired a hope for a tomorrow. Killzone 1 was heavy. It fell different to any other shooter I'd played up until that point. You needed to be precise to stay alive, but the war-torn world around you did everything it could to knock you off balance. It was a frustrating experience at times, especially when the big competitors seemed to favor you hitting highlight-worthy shots at every level. That's what sold it. The world, history and war of Gorilla's Killzone was just that. Frustrating. It wasn't supposed to be easy to find yourself in a firefight with an enemy staring through your soul. It was supposed to be a fight for life and death. And that, beyond any other element, is what Killzone 2 is. It's a PS3 game. And now two generations old title, so technically it might not be all there. But the game uses on-screen effects so liberally and successfully that even today, nearly 15 years later, 
it looks unreal. Killzone 2 isn't afraid of pushing beyond any boundary to achieve its goal. The game is dark in places. Even with setting the brightness correctly, there are sections of your path through Pyrrhus that are lit up by your muscle flash alone. The constant shallow depth of field blurring elements of your weapon along with parts of the environment creates a tunnel vision, only focusing on what is right ahead of you. The Hellgast. Their eyes pierce the dark and their raspy barks and desperate callouts help fill out the audiovisual suite to elevate the experience to yet another level. Killzone 2, just like its predecessor, requires you to be precise. The Hellgast are well armored, and with the last stand of their home fueling them, they take more than their fair share of rounds to knock out. So when you click, your magazine empty and you rush for cover, the blur covering your vision as you spin around, completely hiding the foe you were so sure you were done with, builds on this. It's frustrating. You want to see what you're shooting at, have every honest chance to beat your opponent, but that's not the kind of war Gorilla want to send you to. You are on their turf, and you are going to play by their rules. There are, on top of these effects, a few elements of Killzone 2 that if I describe them to you today, you'd think I was going insane. There is a significant amount of input lag when moving your character through the bombed out city streets. Not a full second, but way beyond what is normal today, and even compared to other PS3 titles or entries of the same series. It's a sluggish, often somewhat frustrating experience. And on top of that, the game doesn't run all that well. 60 frames per second was a luxury back then, and you can completely forget about that, but when the action starts, even 30, 25 is a struggle. But ultimately, both of these things are good. Crucially, I'm not saying we need to accept every poorly optimized game that struggles to hit 60 on even the latest overpriced graphics card. But it's impossible to shy away from the impact that the performance has on Killzone 2's overarching experience. The input lag on your character's movement might be deliberate or just an effect of a lack of optimization experience, but what in Killzone 1 felt heavy, here feels massive. Coming back to the game with current era eyes, the first steps feel like walking through molasses, but once you dig in the trenches, the weight of your equipment, your weapon, your armor, it becomes part of you. Every corner you turn is a skirmish, because if someone's there waiting for you, you have to quickly find your footing and return fire. And the fluidity of that skirmish being highly dependent on how many rounds are flying towards you at a time adds to this panic. If a game drops below a steady frame rate, it's naturally seen as a failure, and it absolutely can be here too. But somehow, knowing that when things go south, nothing can be counted on adds to the war Gorilla has built. It's frustrating, but it kind of feels like it should be. It's a hard call. I don't want to say that every poorly running game is forgiven just because it's tense, but at the same time, in the context, it kind of feels like it fits. It feels like the Hellgast pulling out every stop, overwhelming you at every turn, blanking out the skies, tearing at your lungs with every breath they take. And that is just it. A war gone completely out of control, to the extent where you can't even trust your own eyes. A pivotal moment for the future of humankind and everything is thrown at the wall. Killzone 2 is a masterpiece. It is flawed. It lacks almost any memorable characters, and the story is almost over before it begins. But again, that's kind of what makes it. It's a war game, and every element is drenched in this hopelessness of the soldiers giving their lives for the end of the world. For me, Killzone 2 is perfect. It's everything that it needs to be and nothing else. It's an evolution of the pioneering first entry following the very personal inspirations to their logical end. Despite being set four light years off from the shots that ended the last globe-spanning conflict, their echoes are as clear as day, even through the vacuum of space.
back up his hand. Something from Chick A has his energy there to see that. Worst case of the show there is a full blow. We will be the closer. We're going to have to be the closer. We can run the back of the show. Yeah, the back of the show. Yeah, good job. <laughs> Up already, are we? You know you're supposed to be here two hours ago. No matter. I know it's a long voyage. Sorry about this short notice anyway. But we're going to need some one of your capabilities for this one. All right, here's the situation. Your eyes only. As you can see, this is a satellite scan of our beloved Vecta City. The highlighted part New, New hell of hell. Are you? Oh, they told me this might be an issue with the new cryophones. All right, don't be alarmed. Your memory should return to you in the next couple of hours. But for the sake of all of us, let's see if we can speed that up a bit. Plug in, Marshall. Killzone 3. After the second game's hopeless melancholic ending, it was clear that the war it continued still wasn't over. There was a whole nother act to it. And without wasting any time, Killzone 3 picks up right where its predecessor left off. Visari is dead. The Hellgast on the back foot, but now more than ever, their desperation shines through. Your first missions take you through the recognizable Pyrrhus ruins that still echo the arena that its masterful older sibling reveled in. But as more and more casings hit the ground around you, something feels different. And as the game runs on, taking you out of the ruins of Helgen architecture and into the wilderness, featuring flora and fauna native to the hellscape planet, along with a color palette previously not seen in Gorilla's universe, it's impossible not to notice how different the experience really is. It's the same war, undoubtedly the same ruthless adversaries, and the spectacular visual design the series was founded on certainly isn't lacking here either. And yet, it feels different. I don't see Narville. The river's that way. That's where he said we gotta cross. Yep. Just hope everybody makes it this time. Listen, Sev, about Basari, I... Forget it. I want to shoot him too. But you didn't. No. But that's because I'm not a jackass. The sky is a shade lighter. The smog seems to have lifted. The game is brighter, more colorful, and as you snap your aim over to the head of yet another Visari loyal, you notice the input lag is gone. Many of the features pioneered in Killzone 2 are almost unchanged. In a world at the time obsessed with cover shooter mechanics, Killzone's first person version of the system was always remarkable, keeping you in the middle of the fight, and that's still here, as immersive as ever. But as you rise above the broken wall, the massive weight previously holding you firmly on the ground is gone. Killzone 3 is faster, lighter, and while featuring scenes still depicting a desperate war for a future, somehow feels more hopeful. Now, I know it's weird, mate. After you and your trigger happy buddy ended Vasari, that mass extraction should have brought us all out of here. And we both know how that went. Now, we're stuck in hell. Again. And yet, I can't help it. It feels kind of hopeful. As if in some sick twist of fate, the almighty creators of this everlasting combat odyssey got kind of tired of war. And what better way to end one is there than to just completely annihilate it all. After the death of Visari and the failed ISA extraction from Helgen, the remaining Helgast figure had squabbled over who was the rightful heir to the power as they launched their final assault. In their possession was an arsenal of world-ending petrocyte warheads and their last-ditch target... Earth. This is the story Killzone 3 tells. The few ISA troops left behind on the Helgen surface have to get word out about the impending doom, and if bad comes to worse, 
they have to stop it. It's a fantastical journey, taking you through snow-covered peaks, flying high with experimental jetpack technology and facing almost a thousand feet tall walking behemoths. It's a story of heroism, bravery and big screen escapades and ride in the nick of time as the Hellgast plan seems to come together, effectively ending humanity our heroes stop it. The enemy cruiser carrying the payload is destroyed, the Hellgast made toothless, and the second extrasolar war is effectively over. But as if in an echo of previous tales, it sets off a chain reaction. Secondary explosions are reported all over the surface of planet Helgen, and within moments, the entire globe and everyone still on it... Gone. You better make these recap files long, eh? Oh, right, we don't have this next one on file. Something about the ISA brass not being too fond of us working with mercs or whatever. Where did I put that? Oh, right. I'm sorry. You're gonna have to watch this next one on old tech. Killzone Mercenary It's nigh on impossible to discuss the context of Killzone Mercenary without diving into the tragic tale of the PlayStation Vita. Released just as the year turned over to 2012, the second generation PlayStation handheld had a massive job ahead of it. The precursor PSP had become the first non-Nintendo handheld to truly envelop the world with its estimated 80 plus million units shipped before the production ceased in 2014. The Vita was highly anticipated, boasting not only a dual analog stick control layout more in line with the company's legendary dual shocks, but also a graphical capability that, bar a lower resolution, genuinely seemed to rival that of its home console sibling, the PS3. The future looked promising. New tech, a loved form factor, and improvements that the community had begged for. But after a solid initial period, it quickly fell out of favor. The competitor Nintendo 3DS was just too strong. The advent of smartphones convinced a large amount of potential buyers that all they needed for a quality gaming experience was already in their pocket. And despite a solid launch lineup of games, the publisher's support for the system quickly vanished. Only a select few of Sony's first-party titles made it onto the platform before they pulled the plug, and even fewer outside of Japan. Among them was a solid Uncharted entry, a spin-off of Insomniac's Resistance franchise, and a number of collections of their highly regarded PS2 games. But for many, what ranks as perhaps the greatest Vita game of them all is a side story to our little extrasolar war. In 2013, developed by Guerrilla's Cambridge branch, Killzone Mercenary released. And the game sold well. Well, I mean, it sold well given the four people that owned a Vita, but I'm pretty sure almost all four bought it. So we're batting pretty close to a thousand here. The game transports us back through the war and then spans all throughout the two invasions, but you're not fighting as an ISA soldier this time. Nor did they flip it and make you hell -gassed. No, in Killzone Mercenary, you're walking the fine line in between. In Killzone Mercenary, you're a mercenary. The game follows many of the design choices made in Killzone 3, while pushing certain elements even further. The game is brighter, more vibrant, and is moved even further away from the oppressive war to end all wars of Killzone 2. And even the levels that take place on Helgen itself present completely new areas, all serving a fundamentally different impression of the desolate planet. The game doesn't just ape after its forebears in the gameplay department either. The mercenary setting sees you earn credits to purchase whichever firearm you see fit from either side of the conflict, and as the campaign goes on, you even find yourself accepting contracts from the one so spine-chilling Hellgast, forever putting you at odds with the ISA. As your new employers come up with yet another world-ending scheme, however, it's up to you to find that heart of gold and stop it, ultimately dealing a considerate blow to the Hellgast war machine. This, together with a jaw-dropping ending to the war in Killzone 3, is how we arrive at where we are today.
Ever since the end of the second extrasolar war, we've shared Vecta. The few survivors following the Terracide, perhaps in hopes of reconciliation over the Exodus, were welcomed on the planet. Vecta City split in two. New Helgen was established and the wall dividing the neighboring sectors was built. Humans previously living in the now Helgast controlled region were evicted. If they refused, they were shot. Human Helgast racial tensions remain high and the winds of a blossoming conflict are constantly blowing. But as of now, for the first time in a lot of citizens' lives, there is peace. An uneasy one, but peace nonetheless. You done? <laughs> Jesus. Kind of wish that guy would keep it brief for once. All right. Once your real memories come back, you might be a little bit hazy, but take this one for the team, a champ. Now, where were we? Now that you're up to speed, here's the situation. Killzone 2, 3, and Mercenary had all been technical marvels on their respective platforms. But just as the world moved on from the aging architecture of the PS2 with the original entry, so was the world ready to take yet another step. On the dawn of the eighth console generation, Sony had emerged as favorites and their considerable technological upgrade in their PlayStation 4 was highly anticipated. Many of the launch titles were multi-generational releases, only receiving what felt like HD upgrades, but for the next war story developed by the now fully grown Guerrilla Games, that wasn't the case. Killzone Shadowfall released alongside the PS4, and while it was clear the conflict had taken a turn, the visual design evolved considerably and new to the series elements were experimented with one thing it kept in line with its siblings. It looked unreal. Shadowfall ushered the universe into another stage. The extrasolar wars were now over. In their place, a chillingly familiar sight took hold and an era of Cold War was established. The missions of Guerrilla's sixth Killzone games are less open warfare than any of the previous titles and instead place you in the shoes of a Shadow Marshal, an elite special forces operative conducting whatever the ISA needs done behind enemy lines. By the almighty wall. No one gets in, no one gets out. Except for you. You are to infill at this point. At 600 hours, our contact will meet you there and get you to the other side. From here, make your way deep into the containment city. Level 3 or 4 is where we last heard our informant. Get her out. Any way you can. <laughs> Oh, one more thing. The future is counting. It's up to you to make it happen. Killzone Shadowfall is different. It's quiet. It's still. And even when the floodgates open, it's hopeful. 
operating behind enemy lines, placing the entire experience on something far below the warring factions, shifts the focus away from the bombastic assaults and planet-shattering invasions of yesteryear, running missions taking you directly through people's apartments, living rooms and the slums where they've been forced to set up, shines a light on who always ends up taking the brunt of the aggression when the ones upstairs want to go to war. The people on either side of the wall, whether living in comparable perceived freedom or below an openly oppressive regime, share a wish to end the hatred. But that's not all. For as deep in despair as the Killzone universe has often existed in, the later titles culminating in Shadowfall show that beyond any other element, the people, no matter sector, all manage to hold on to one thing. Hope. I don't care who you are, just help! Somebody please help us! This is all I have. Thank you. You have to tell your people to stand down. We can't let this happen, Kellen, not again. It's innocent people who pay with their lives. Killzone Shadowfall was seen as a rejuvenation, a rebirth of the series, not only bringing it into the next generation technology-wise, but seemingly also through its narrative threads. But I think this started years back. The sky is a shade lighter. There was never any mistaking what kind of games Killzone 1 and Killzone 2 were just like there was no mistaking what kind of war they were so heavily influenced by. Killzone 1 started it all. The first stumbling steps by a new studio wanting to tell their story, confidently differently than any other competitor. The world it presented was bleak, grey, and its enemy ruthless and stopping at nothing to see you dead. It was a story of fighting against a supremacist invasion, ultimately stopping it and retaining your freedom, but even in its highest highs it felt melancholic. There were heroes, but it lacked the heroism. And this thread continued in 2009 with Killzone 2. A graphical masterwork, despite being nearly 15 years old, still holding up. It told the story of the counter-invasion, bringing the war to the adversary's front doorstep and putting an end to it once and for all. It was set up to be a glorious march to end the war that would end all wars, but as soon as Planetfall occurred, it was something else entirely. The Killzone identity established and the first game was expanded upon. Every step felt like it carried the weight of the world and even the gameplay mechanics were altered to make the experience a struggle to get to grips with. The heroes of the Vector Defense were gone, instead replaced by grizzled, war-torn, desperate soldiers wanting nothing more than to put an end to this whole thing and go home. And even on the final note, having captured the supremacist leader, it ends on a melancholic tone. Sergeant, what happened? Shit. Seth! God damn it! It's a game of grime, dust, dirt, and hate. Completely unlikable characters and clunky movement. It's a game that's disorientating, harsh and sluggish. It's mundane, bleak, and unceremonious. It confidently never eases up to give you any satisfaction of fighting in a war, and it desperately wants you to remember that you've just stepped into hell. Personnel to battle stations. Repeat. All personnel to battle stations. Shit! What now? Come on! Sir, let's go! Move! For me, Killzone 2 is the perfect war game. It does everything it has to convey what it wants to say, but nothing else. It's a simple struggle all the way through, and at the final note, after building it up with the tensest, hardest, most frustrating fight the game has to offer, it leaves you wondering what it was even good for in the first place.
But as Gorilla emerged from the smoke, something was different. The sky was a shade lighter. You pushed into the dark. You stood on a threshold before deciding to dive into the abyss to tell the story you wanted to tell. You've painted your world with the darkest hues and brought forth something primordial. You've battled your way into hell. You've conquered all it had to stand against you. And where has that left you? You've made a home for yourself, a deeply respected, envied home where you can forever be the studio that made the greatest war game of all time. But seemingly, Gorilla didn't see it like that. Just like the people offering up their lives for the conquest of their superiors, they held on to something else. For the world they cared so deeply for, had dreamt up and nurtured into their livelihoods, they saw a different future they saw hope. With Killzone 3 and Mercenary, it seems Gorilla took a deep look at their universe, without forgetting the groundwork that had made it all possible with confidence, an expanded color palette and the same visual design ethos that had always permeated the series, they started climbing out of the abyss. The war was still desperate, still leaving humanity on their last legs, but instead of the endless trenches and back alleys lit only by your adversary's glowing eyes, it looked up, found conviction in the fantastical, and went on to create two experiences with everything Killzone 2 had deemed unimportant. Characters were now memorable. Locations pushed out of the dark and desperately needed heroics were found at every turn. Gorilla had set out to explore their universe. What else could they do? What other stories were there still to tell? What nuances were left undiscussed? Could you really tell a war story? without an active war. As of 2023, Shadowfall is the last dive into the Killzone universe we've gotten. And here, more than ever before, it's clear Gorilla wanted to explore new things. They dove deep into the underbelly of the conflict, explored right and wrong, and didn't shy away from the racial tensions that had always laid in the middle of the conflict. With their last foray into the universe they had created, Gorilla pushed their world far into the future, established a society split in two, and just like the history it so clearly echoes, the crude dark steel outlines of the armory gave way for aluminum, composite, and polymers. The visual design transformed from a war fought out of desperation to a peace kept out of necessity. We haven't got much time. I'm not going to harm you. The attack on Vecta had nothing to do with us. I want to end this, not start another war. And for anyone familiar with the studio's future, that visual design might now start to seem familiar. Four years after the last war game, Guerrilla released their first non-Killzone title since the series started. The instantly adored, worldwide mass success, Horizon Zero Dawn. Horizon was in so many ways the complete opposite of what the Killzone series had been. It was wide open, often lonely, and instead of carrying what felt like the weight of the world, Aloy was agile, quick, and her movement became a crucial part of the experience. You were able to tackle it in almost any way you saw fit. An open world, yours for the taking. Explore how you will, play how you want. The game went on to become one of the best-selling titles of its generation. And as it released on PC as well, the sales 
exploded. Horizon brought a new wave to the Dutch studio and their years of practice had set them up to once again create a truly one-of-a-kind visual design. Just like everything else they had taken on, Horizon looked unreal. It played purposefully and wrapped things up with incredible presentation. The war was well and truly over. Guerrilla had envisioned a world defined by nothing but its conflict. And 14 development years, 5 platforms and 6 games later, as the studio's credits slowly scroll across the screen, they had created a universe filled to the brim with memorable moments, world-class design and explosive narrative turns that all, while just like its inspirations, always stemmed from war, had risen above. They went to explore hell, conquered it, and then still dared to hope. So, did it end up killing Halo? <laughs> no, not even close. It sold well, yeah, sure, but Halo, Halo is a juggernaut. It'll be around far longer than both you and I will be. But for a number of years and the last 50 or so minutes, I'd completely forgotten about it. What if humanity fought itself? Bim 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 bim. Bim 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 bim. Bim 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 bim. Bim 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 bim.